So in our trilogy about cache implementations, we have now reached uh, the last episode. Uh, we're going to talk about some further optimizations you can do it with traditional caches. And also we're going to talk about uh, more innovative caches or, or funky caches. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is replacement. So given that you have a set associative cache, so in this example here, I'm showing a four-way set associative cache. Um, and assuming that all the four places of this set is full and that we now want to insert a new piece of data, a cache line into that set, we have to choose who, which one of these four to replace or which one should be the victim. A very common algorithm for doing this is called least recently used re replacement algorithm, where we simply throw out the long the piece of data, the cache line, which has been unused the longest time. In order for us to figure that one out, we have to add a little bit of history information to each cache line. Uh, sorry, history information to each set, so we can can figure out which of these cache lines has been unused the longest time. This is often considered the best uh, replacement algorithm, but as we'll see in, in a little while, this is not always the case. Also, LRU replacement requires this extra history information to keep track of what's going on with cache lines. And if you have many cache lines in the set, if the associativity is high, the extra bits needed here may introduce an, an unnecessary large overhead. Also, this history requires you to read the, uh, the history uh, of the previous state of, of this set and then after an access store a new history back so it's a read modify write access and that's not always appreciated by people designing fast caches another algorithm which is easier to implement is not most recently used where you simply just remember which of these four cache lines was most recently used and at the replacement you make sure you don't replace that cache line but otherwise you can randomly choose among the others. This is more practical. It doesn't require read, modify, write, just a write for each access. And for example, for an eight way cache, three bits of history information would be sufficient. There are other ways uh, also to try to implement a pseudo LRU uh, algorithm that, that uh, appears to work almost like, like a least recently used, but has a much uh, more, less expensive uh, implementation. Finally, there is one fairly common replacement strategy, which is simply random replacement. You just randomly pick one out of the four, throw that one out of the cache, and hopefully you cannot continuously have bad luck. So if you happen to throw out a cache line, which was very precious to you, that you will access soon again, well, next time you exit, it will be brought into the cache, and hopefully some other cache line will be thrown out the next time. Here is a study uh, that compares uh, how an LRU algorithm compares with a random uh, algorithm. So you have the miss, uh, miss ratio on this axis, so lower is better. And here you have a cache size. So you can see to the right here that for the uh, benchmark eQuake, uh, random replacement always performs worse than the LRU uh, replacement algorithm. But for the left, uh, application ART, uh, Neural Network Simulator from the SPEC 2000 benchmark suite, we can see that LRU uh, algorithm performs worse when you go between 128 kilobyte caches up to about 500 or a little more, uh, 512 kilobyte caches. So why is that? Well, uh, the ART um, application has a very popular data structure, which is like a vector. So here's the size of this vector. Um, and um, when you have caches that are smaller, slightly smaller than the size of that vector, uh, then it becomes uh, suboptimal to implement the LRU algorithm. So this vector, you go through this vector from the beginning to the end over and over again in this simulation. And if you have an LRU algorithm and the caches is slightly smaller than the vector, then the LRU algorithm will make sure uh, that the oldest piece of data is thrown out over and over again. And that actually will, will, will be much more suboptimal than if you just randomly throw out a piece of data. Because if you, since, since the uh, cache is too small to hold the, other, the entire vector, uh, just randomly throwing something out uh, actually produces a much better performance. 
Another issue you have to deal with is how to handle dirty cache lines in a cache. So there are two ways of doing that. One implementation is called write back caches. In these implementations, we add one extra bit per cache line. And the first time uh, the CPU writes to that cache line, we will set the dirty bit and that will stay. Uh, it's a sticky bit, so it, it will stay set. Uh, when we need to replace that cache line, uh, then the dirty, when the set dirty bit will tell us that we need to perform a write back. We will take the value stored in the cache and write that back to memory. We can't just toss that cache line over our shoulder. So that, that's why it's called the write back cache. On the write through cache, on the other hand, um, we always will write through uh, uh, the information to the memory. So whenever a store is performed to the cache, we will also update the memory or the next level, level in the cache hierarchy right away. That means that there will never be dirty data in the cache and we will never perform write-backs. Write-through is a simpler design, write-back slightly more complicated. Um, often, first-level caches, small caches are implemented as write-through uh, because you, you would like to avoid the complexity uh, because you typically want very sh short access times to those caches, while write-backs uh, typically suit larger caches much better. There is also a device uh, sort of like a cache uh, in modern CPUs, which is called the store buffer or write buffer. So they come from the observation that reads are, from a latency point of view, much more important than writes. So if you perform a bunch of reads and a bunch of writes, you should give priority to the reads, because the reads are going to bring new and exciting uh, data back to your registers, and you may have data dependencies that need those pieces of data right away. On the other hand, in order for it to perform the store, well, you don't need uh, any, no, you need to, need to know the old value of the word you're just about to overwrite. And as long as you perform the store eventually in a finite period of time, uh, it's going to be okay. So in these implant implantations, we uh, the write back buffer sits uh, sort of in between the CPU and the cache in this example, and stores are being put into the write back buffers and those stores are being performed whenever we have time to do so by uh, loading cache lines into the cache and modifying uh, whatever word we'd like to store to. But these write backs or the, the writes can be stored in the write back buffer for a long time. Meanwhile, we can allow the loads to bypass those stores. There are some number of comparators here that makes, compares the address of the new loads bypassing the write backs uh, uh, with the address of the words that we would like to, to modify. And if there is a match, we make sure that the new value stored in the write back buffer is actually turned to the load rather than the old uh, value that is still the stale value that's in the cache. Power consumption is becoming more and more important. Uh, and this applies mostly to the CPUs, but also to a larger extent uh, to caches. So we have to understand how to design caches which are not only fast, but also that consumes uh, the least amount of, of power. There are two kind, kinds of, of uh, powers. There is static power or leakage power, uh, which comes from the fact that each transistor, even if it's turned off, uh, will leak um, some current uh, from the minus to the plus uh, of, of the power source, and that will uh, produce or, or consume power. Uh, this power is proportional to the cache capacity. So it's, you know, the more transistors you have, the more leakage there will be. So the more in a cache design, the more bits you're storing, the larger will the static power be. Dynamic power uh, is only comes from what activities you have in, in the cache. So if you don't read or write to cache, the dynamic power will be zero. You will only have the static power. Um, so the, the dynamic power is the extra energy needed to read uh, the SRAMs bit out of that big SRAM array we used to implement the caches. So the dynamic power is proportional to the number of bits uh, read from the SRAM, while the static power is proportional to the number of SRAM bits stored in the SRAM. So which power dominates different caches? Well, it, for small and fast associative caches, uh, then the number of bits is not that high, but we read data with a high frequency and also the associativity will add to the power consumption. 
which gives us uh, more dynamic power consumption than static power consumption. While large caches typically have don't have as frequent accesses, uh, which means the dynamic dynamic power is, is lower, but also has a lot of, of capacity data SRAM bits. So therefore, the, the static power will dominate for those caches. So LLC stands for last level cache and L1 stands for first level cache. So here's a, an old picture we've seen before. It's an example of an implementation of a, an associative cache where we uh, access the left and the right data at the same time, which means it will bring out the left address tag uh, and the right address tag, and also will bring out the left piece of data and the right piece of data at the same time. As we already noticed, the latency is SRAM plus CMP plus AND plus logic plus max. The dynamic power is proportional to the amount of data we read out. So it's roughly proportional to two times the tag size and two times the data size, since it's a two-way set associative cache. And you can imagine in a four-way set associative cache, these numbers would open, both be, be changed to four uh, in, instead. If you like to save um, energy in, in an uh, associative cache, we could still do what's called a phased uh, cache lookup. And this is what you often have in the larger caches, like the last level cache in the multicore. So here we have changed the cache design such that we only have the two address tags sitting together and the valid bit in one array. This is a two-way set associative cache in that we bring out both the left address tag and the right address tag at the same time we do the comparisons in parallel. The logic that produces the select signal, instead of driving the max, we're going to use the select signal as one extra bit to index the large data array. And here, uh, the data we requested is going to be uh, accessed by using the 17 bits we used to index uh, the, uh, the address uh, tags plus this extra bit. So you can either use the left word is going to be up here and the right word is going to be somewhere down here, even though it's not shown on this picture. Uh, and so by doing by having it this way, you can have a an access time that goes through first accessing the address tags, then all those comparatives and, and logics and so on. And then goes through this larger restroom here and you get the data. Um, so the question is, when you have this kind of design, what kind of energy will be saved compared with a fast cache design? Well, the answer is you will uh, save dynamic power, not static power, because we have the same amount of SRAM if you add the size of this SRAM. With that size of this SRAM, it will be the same as the large SRAM array in the previous picture, while we uh, will read out much less data. Instead of reading out two data words in parallel, here we only read out one data word in parallel. So the latency of this design will be first the SRAM of the address tag, then compare it, then the AND logic, and then a second SRAM latency. So the latency for reading data out of this cache is higher than the previous design, but the dynamic power uh, is proportional to tags plus only one times the data contained in a cache line. And since cache lines tend to be much larger than the tag arrays, this could be a, a big save. Modern CPUs implement a cache topology, which is called Harvard architecture. And this is for all historical reasons. There was an architecture in the 1940s uh, implemented at Harvard architecture, and it had a separate memory storing data and a separate memory storing instructions. Well, in the modern CPU, we sort of have a similar kind of, of, of structure where we actually, actually have a separate data and instruction first level caches. Okay, so why do we have a, uh, implement this extra cost of having separate data and instruction cache. Well, often we need to, to continuously fetch instructions uh, from the instruction cache. So we know to, to and decode them and so on in the instruction fetch stage of the pipeline. And at the same time, many instructions also need to access data. So if we had a single first level cache, there would be a conflict. There would be a resource conflict between fetching instructions and fetching data, having separate data instruction and data and instruction caches allow us to fetch instruction and data at the same time. Uh, however, in the higher level caches, we're going to say see 
um, the second and third level caches, we're going to have what's called a unified cache that stores both instruction and data. So this is what the cache hierarchy of the day often looks like. So you have the CPU on the chip here, and on the same chip, you have the data, L1 data cache, and it's made small enough to keep up with the frequency, the execution rate of the CPU. You have another cache, which is a small instruction cache. It's also small. Typically, they are about the same size, uh, and these can be accessed in parallel. Sometimes the cache line is different in one in the data cache than in the instruction cache because there could be different trade-offs. Um, higher up in the cache hierarchy, you have the typically you have a, a second-level cache that only this CPU will access, and the size of that cache will be, you know, roughly ten times larger than the L1 data cache maybe up to 20 times larger in modern CPUs. You will have many of these kind of designs sitting in parallel uh, on the chip. So that's how you get the multi-cores, many CPUs, each one with a local uh, data and instruction and L2 caches. And then you have a unified last level cache. So here comes the LLC again. Uh, so you use whatever transistors are left uh, on the chip to make that as large as possible because all you would really like to make sure that it's rare that you have to go off the chip and access the DRAM memory, which, as we know, is, is very slow. So which of these statements are true about L1 caches? Uh, energy consumption is dominated by static power. They are often implemented as fast caches. Actually, they're not implemented as phased caches. And sometimes they have smaller cache lines than L2. Which of these statements are true about large last level caches? So NEB consumption is dominated by static power. They are implemented as fast caches, so they're not implemented as, as phased caches. Uh, and they, uh, this, the cache is often shared by many CPUs or cores. Now moving on to uh, more features that you often see uh, in modern CPUs. Uh, one such feature is a little green man uh, called the hardware prefetcher. So the hardware prefetcher is one of these speculative algorithms uh, that, that sits on the chip, is implemented on the, on the chip and tries to anticipate what you are going to access next. And that piece of data that the, this Oracle thinks you're going to access next is prefetched by this oracle into the data cache. Uh, so an idea here is to improve the memory level parallelism. So it's not only your own cache misses that will bring data into the cache. Also, this little green man will, will try to bring data into the cache to make sure that you will use, uh, it will, uh, you will see, your likelihood of seeing cache hits uh, is improved. But that also means that there's going to be more activities happening at the, at the memory interface. So you're going to have more outstanding memory transactions at the same time. So that improves the memory level parallelism of your architecture. There are a couple of, of different uh, prefetching algorithms. The most common one is called consequential prefetching, where you try to uh, detect a stream like A, A plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3, A plus 4. And if you detect such a, a sequential stream of accesses, it's very easy to predict uh, what uh, your program is about to do in the future. So, so this, this kind of sequential prefetch is just tries to keep a stream going and figures out how much ahead of time it needs to bring the data into the cache to make sure it's there on time when you need it. Uh, implementations often has a, some fixed number of, of streams supported. So one such number in modern chips is is, is 16, so you can have 16 sequential streams active at the same time. Uh, this kind of prefetching is often implemented in the L2 and L3 caches, but not in L1 because it's not precise enough. We don't want to accidentally uh, bring the wrong kind of data into L1. Instead, the L1 caches has a different prefetch algorithm, which is uh, uh, what, what we refer to as a PC-based PC prefetching. So, uh, here we try to identify some instructions that are frequently accessed 
for example, an instruction in a loop. And then we try to see if there is a specific access pattern for that specific instruction. For example, does this instruction access data with a, one, with a constant stride, a, a plus 16, a plus 32, and so on. Um, if so, then we will start a, a prefetch activity uh, that will bring data into the L1. So this is a little more precise uh, uh, prefetching algorithm. So that's why we there bringing data into L1. But it can also detect strides which are not just sequential streams, but also strides of a large, uh, large constant. Uh, the third common hardware prefetching algorithm is adjacent prefetching. So on a miss to a specific cache line, uh, the adjacent prefetching will automatically bring in some of the neighboring cache lines, like the one before and or uh, the cache line right after it. Uh, this is also only done for L2 and L3 uh, uh, caches because it's also a very imprecise algorithm. And it sometimes can help you uh, speeding up commercial applications or application that use, has irregular access patterns with this, uh, the sequential prefetch is not going to do a, a good job. But when you have things like data objects and so on, uh, bringing the neighboring cache line uh, is sometimes a good idea. So here you have the cache hierarchy. Uh, so I, I have shown this picture to you before. Uh, to the left, you have the cores. Um, the green areas corresponds to the different cache levels of, uh, of, of this architecture. So this is the Nehalem architecture. Uh, the area of the, each cache level corresponds to how much cache capacity you have at that level. Uh, the blue, the width of the blue line tells how much bandwidth you have between each level in the cache hierarchy. And what you should notice here is that the, the bandwidth decreases the higher, the further away you get from, from the course, but also that the cache size increases. And an interesting thing is all four cores here will have to share uh, the bandwidth of this single thin line going to memory. Um, what you also see here is what the latency is to the different level in the cache hierarchy. So it's a four cycle access to the first level cache, 10 cycle access to the second level cache, 38 cycles uh, to the third level cache, and 190 cycles going to the DRAM for this specific cache design you see here. And at each level, you have this hardware prefetcher that will help you bring in the data. And as we've seen before, at each of these levels in the cache hierarchy, so here you, you see the sizes, that, you know, the first level cache data and instruction of 64 kilobytes. Then the L2 cache is 256 kilobytes and the L3 cache is eight megabytes, uh, numbers corresponding to the previous picture of, of one of the Nehalem chips. All of these levels in the cache hierarchy are implemented as set associative caches. So you have some address here, typically it's not a 32 bit address, it's, it's has more bits, uh, 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 often referred to as a 64-bit address, but that's uh, not really true in the implementation, but that's assumed so for now. Um, these addresses uh, are used, some part of the addresses used as an index function to find the right uh, set of the cache, and it's a set associative cache, so you have many placement choices. In this example here, it's an eight-way set associative cache. Um, and each one of these eight pl placement choices you have uh, the data, the cache line, which is uh, typically 64 byte cache line. You have sort of a valid bit. This is uh, uh, implemented as a state information. Uh, we will leverage this when we talk about coherence implementation later on in, in cache coherence. And you have the address tag that's used to compare to figure out which of these eight places, if any, uh, corresponds to the piece of data that you were looking for. And if one of them of these comparisons is a hit. Well, we know that that is going to drive a max and the max is going to pick out the very piece of data that we're interested in and send that to the cache, to, to the CPU. So a little cache lingo here. Uh, we talked about all these before. Cache line is the chunk of data that is moved to and from caches or between caches and memory or the uh, higher levels in the cache hierarchy. Uh, cache set is the fraction of the cache identified by the, the one of these index functions. Associativity is the number of alternative storage places uh, uh, for a cache line within the set. Replacement policy picks the victim from the set uh, and 
we talked about LRU random and uh, there is a special algorithm in Nehalem that we haven't talked about. We talked about two kinds of localities that really makes caches work. The temporal locality, you're likely to access the same data soon again, and spatial locality, which says that you're likely to access some nearby data soon again. And we looked at, at this typical access pattern identifying the spatial and the temporal localities. Another important property when you have multi-level caches like the ones you have in Nehalem uh, is to figure out uh, how much you replicate the data between uh, the different levels in the cache hierarchy. And there are at least three options how you can do that. You can have inclusive caches, which is something that Intel has implemented for a long period of time. They're moving you know, slowly and slowly, moving away from these kind of implementations. So in an inclusive cache, um, Whenever you hit in, let's say, the L2 cache, okay, you will install a copy of the data in the L1 cache, but keep the data also in L2. Whenever the data in L2 is replaced, then we force an eviction from the L1 as well. So uh, this implies that we have an invariant that says if the data is not in L2, then we know for sure that it's not in L1 either. If the data is both in L2 and L1, and we replace it from L1, then we, of course, will just keep it in, in L2. Non-inclusive caches, which is something that AMD has been building for a long period of time, uh, it has a slightly different implementation. So when you make an access that means in the first level cache and hit in the second level cache, you install a copy of the cache run in L, L1, and you also keep the data in L2. However, when the data is L2 is replaced, uh, then the data in L1 survives. So the invariant of, of the previous, uh, or the inclusive caches don't hold there. If the data is not in L2, it may still very well be in L1. There's also an invariant, uh, in another variation of non-inclusive, which is also partly implemented by AMD, which is called exclusive caches. So here, when you miss in the L1 cache, you hit the data in, in L2, you move the data from L2 to L1. So the data no longer resides in L2. At uh, L1 replacement, you move the data back to L2 again. So here's an invariant that says the data is either in L1 or L2, but are never in both levels. So different strategies, and these may actually be mixed in different implementations. So if you look at the Halem implementation once more, uh, what you're going to see here, at the first level, you have 32 kilobyte caches. It's an eight-way associative cache impl implementing pseudo LRU implementation. And it's a fast cache implementation. So you do a parallel lookup of all the data and all the address tags uh, at the same time. The second level cache is a 256 kilobyte, eight-way, also pseudo LRU, non-inclusive cache. And it's a phased cache. So you only look at the, all the address tags in parallel, but you don't bring out all the data in parallel because speed doesn't matter so much. You would rather would like to save energy at this level. It's a non-inclusive cache. Uh, so uh, even if you, uh, the, the data, uh, um, so, so the invariant of, of the non-inclusive uh, data holds here, which is different from invariant from the next level cache, which third level cache, which is an inclusive cache. So in the inclusive cache, it says, if you don't find the data in L3, you know that it's not in L2 as well. Uh, the L3 uh, is a 16-way uh, set associated cache. They have a spe sp special cheap way, uh, combination of pseudo LRU and not uh, MRU uh, uh, replacement algorithm. Uh, and it's also a phased cache because the speed is not that important at that level. So take a message from caches. Caches are small, but fast. A cache space is allocated in cache line chunks, 64 bytes, for example. The least uh, significant part of the address is used to find the cache sets. So it's used uh, as an index function to find a subset of the cache where the data may reside. 
there is a limited uh, number of cash lines per set and that corresponds to its associativity. Typically, we have several levels of caches in, in the cache hierarchy and the associativity in cache line sizes and so on may differ between the different sizes. And caches are probably the most important target for software optimizations. And we're going to talk about that uh, to some, some gory detail in, later on in this course. Lastly, I would like to share with you some of the funner caches. So innova cache, innovative caches, or sometimes referred to as funky caches. Uh, one such innovative cache, which has been implemented several times in commercial products is a victim cache. So victim cache, victim cache is a fairly small and it's fairly associative cache that sits in parallel with the, with, with, uh, the, the cache it works together with. So it's, it's sort of extra cache that assists some other cache. So much smaller than that cache, much more associative than, than the other cache. On a cache lookup, you have to look both in the cache and in the victim cache at the same time because you don't know where the data may be. So you have a parallel lookup in both cache and, and victim cache. On cache replacement, when you place a piece of data from the red cache, then you bring that victim into the victim cache and you kick some older victim uh, out, out of the victim cache. Uh, if you find the data you're looking for, uh, the cache lookup in the victim cache, then you're going to give that cache line a second life by moving it back into its prime location in the, in, 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 in the main cache. So the question is, what kind of misses are primarily removed by a victim cache? Uh, capacity misses, conflict misses, or compulsory misses? So that is, uh, of course, uh, conflict misses because the cache lines that have big conflicts going on here uh, can leverage the limited associativity, the, the extra associativity of the victim cache uh, to let those cache lines survive for a longer period of time. It may be reused here before they're being thrown out again. So the victim cache is really improving the uh, or removing conflict misses more than anything else. Of course, it also makes the total cache capacity slightly larger, but that is, is just a, a marginal effect. Another way to save uh, power in, in a cache, we already looked at the uh, phased cache lookup. Uh, even better way to save power is to use what's called uh, some way prediction algorithm. And what I'm showing you here is a very, very simplistic way prediction uh, to implement a two-way set associated cache. So this prediction uh, 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 hopes it lives hopes that the simple algorithm saying that you're more, more likely for each set in the in the cache you're more likely to access the same way the next time as well as you are accessing the other way of that cache. So we we have here is a, a 128k bits in a vector called the prediction bits. We index them with our normal 17 bits uh, to go take out the prediction or rather the history, which one of the two sets did we access before. That bit is added to uh, the index, the 17 bit index to make an 18 bit, 8 bit index and find exactly that piece of data of that set that we accessed before. Uh, in, in one single access. The other uh, piece of data in the same set resides somewhere else, down, not shown on this picture. But, uh, so if this correction that you, if the, this prediction is correct, which is that you are more likely to access the same way of the set that you accessed before, then the latency for this lookup is going to be a tiny SRAM lookup just to get this bit. So then it's not going to take that long time. Plus the SRAM lookup of the large cache plus the comparators plus the AND gate. And here the interesting thing is the dynamic power goes down because you only need to access uh, one tag uh, and also uh, one piece of data, even though it's a two-way set associative cache. Another kind of optimizations that you also uh, are likely to see in commercial uh, uh, caches now and then is what's called the sub-locked cache. So here is the idea that 
what this picture shows is a single uh, block which is divided into several sub blocks. The sub block stores one cache line. So in this example, for each uh, entry into the cache, there are four cache lines that can be stored. However, the difference between this cache and a set associative cache is that these four cache lines must be adjacent to each other. So when we allocate space in this cache, we allocate space for four cache lines, even though we only require one of them to be valid, one or a few to be valid. So as you see here, all these cache lines has a common uh, uh, address tag together. And then if this address tag corresponds to a certain value, then we know exactly which these which cache lines are supposed to be stored in these four locations. Then we have a separate valid bit for each one of these cache line locations to set, tell which of these cache lines are uh, really valid. Uh, this is a neat way of uh, reducing the overhead, uh, the cache implementation overhead. The, the memory overhead here is only 3% because we have these bits of the, the 12 bits uh, of the address tag, and then we have these four valid bits. So that's 16 bits uh, over the whole payload here, which is 512 uh, 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 useful da data words, uh, uh, data bits in, in this example, so 3% overhead. Um, the pros and cons of a sublock cache is that it lowers the memory overhead, it, that it's it's prime, prime key. Uh, it also avoids some of the problems with false sharing that we've talked about later on in, in coherence and multiprocessors. But there can also be big performance drawbacks from using uh, uh, this kind of cache. It will not ex uh, explore as much spatial locality as, as you would with a normal large cache line implementation. And it could still have a bad utilization of SRAM just as you would with uh, using large cache lines in, in the Pre previous designs. We also have one last uh, interesting uh, cache, which is called a skewed associative cache. So explain, let, so in order for me to explain why uh, this cache is, is um, useful, you're going to look at a simple example. So here we have a, a two-way uh, associative cache, and we have three very popular pieces of data that all of them happens to index to the same place in the cache. Of course, if we instead have had had, had a four-way set associative cache, all those pieces of data would have fitted, but now we only have a two-way set associative cache. Maybe we have a two-way set associative cache because we would like to save power. That would be one design point or make a simpler cache. Uh, what I'd like to show to you now is the skewed uh, associative cache. Skewed associative cache, at the first look, looks like, for example, a two-way two -way set associative cache. But there is one big difference here. The index function used for the right half of the cache is different from the index function used for the left half of the cache. So even though uh, all of A, B, and C have the same index function to the left side of the cache, they may very well have different index functions to the right side of the cache. So it's very unlikely that they will collide both in the left half and in the right half. So that makes it more likely for you to actually be able to store important data in a cache. And it has been shown that this kind of, of two-way skewed set, set associative cache performs uh, uh, roughly the same as a four-way cache uh, running uh, you know, practical experiments. And it, of course, uses much less power than a four-way set associative cache. So here's an example of how you would implement this, a, a skewed associative cache. So you would simply have uh, two different functions. Uh, this one of these functions could be the trivial function we used before, just you know select 17 bits and and index into into the cache. While the other uh, function must be more complex and must be used different bits than just those, those 17 bits. So in this example, we have used to say that it can be more than 18 bits or or more as as input to to these functions in order for these uh, skewed associative cache to make sense. Otherwise, it looks like a, a, a two-way set, two set associative cache just using different index function for the left and right. Other, uh, everything else looks very similar. So here's a question. Uh, so why does a two-way skewed cache use less power than a four-way uh, cache? Is it because it has 
much fewer SRAM bits in total, static energy? Is it because it reads fewer bits from the SRAM on the cache lookup, its dynamic energy? Or is it that because it works at the lower frequency? So it's because it reads um, uh, fewer bits. It only reads uh, half as many bits uh, out of the SRAM as you would with a four-way set resource to cache. In some of the research we've done here in Uppsala, Uppsala the Uppsala Architecture Research Group, or UART for short, uh, we took this uh, uh, skewed cache and we said that you can actually do better than this. We have something called an elbow cache, where we would like to increase the associativity behavior even more, even though the hardware design looks exactly the same as for a skewed cache. So here I have an example with A and B. Um, um, happily uh, have put the data in into this uh, two-way skewed associative cache. Along comes a third piece of data, C. C now also wants to put its data in the cache. But as you can see, it collides with B on the left side, and it collides with, uh, with A on the right-hand side. So there is no way for it to put data in the cache without kicking either A or B out of the cache. And if what we did in, in for the elbow cache was that we detected the age of the, the, the data A and, and B. And if the age or the time they've been, uh, how long they've been unused in the cache, if that's a short period of time, then we said, this is not good. We don't want to throw them out. So instead, in those situations, we reallocated data. So of course, uh, the yellow data, data A, has yet another place in the cache where it may live. And if that place is it's not free, or if there is an old piece of data stored there, it's much better for us to just move the data up to that alternative location and let C put its data in its old location. So that's called a, an elbow cache. And there's been uh, other people reinventing the same thing recently. They call it the Z cache. So this performs roughly the same, actually, as an eight-way set associative cache. It access time is actually slightly faster than an eight-way cache, and it uses much less dynamic power. So how are we doing here? We have now completed all the three parts of the trilogy about uh, caches. Uh, how are we doing with uh, our mission of creating locality, parallelism, and speculative execution? Well, we have talked about quite a lot of these items. We have talked about spatial locality and temporal locality. We have when we talked about memory level parallelism and and um, um, and uh, hardware prefetching, we actually covered cover the item C here of the parallelism. We also in in the introduction uh, of this course talked a little about ILP and TLP, but we will certainly re return to those speculative things. We have not talked about out of order, and uh, we have not really talked about branch prediction, but we did talk about prefetching. So prefetching, of course, is a speculative algorithm. We don't know for sure uh, what would happen. Another kind of speculative algorithm uh, that we explored, which is not listed here, uh, was the way prediction. We speculated that we knew which way we would access the data from and try to uh, leverage that. So here are the goals for this course again. Uh, we have covered a little bit of the memory organization. Uh, we have certainly uh, uh, talked about memory level parallels. We have uh, talked a little bit about energy. Uh, 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 so we, we can check some of these items off uh, for now.